Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. This is Matthew Raphael Johnson, which should not surprise you. Today is the 17th of March, 2021. Today I am coming from you on location in eastern Pennsylvania, uh, across the state from where I normally live. If there's any differences in, in how I sound, that must be that must be the reason. Um, but thanks to my donors and friends, I have a job where I could pretty much do this anywhere. And as always, I thank my supporters in that respect. Um, and speaking of money, I um, I want to talk about economics today. When I do my show on Thursday with. Sven Longshanks, international political economy is one of the things that comes up. It comes up for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's extremely important and that it affects us every single day. And number two, that most people don't know much about it because it's usually very technical. Um, it uses quite a bit of mathematics and the vocabulary is usually very specialized. Um, and of course, there is, because of that, loads of myths about it. But I wrote a paper for the Warden Post back, I think it was 2017. And I've not spoken about it on this show before. It was controversial. My stuff tends to be controversial um, for a few reasons. And the title, now this, of course... I'm dealing with the same topic, but this is not the exact same paper. The title is The Fable of Capitalist Efficiency, Capitalism as a Dominance of Conspicuous Waste and Extravagance. And we're told every day, even by the left, the love affair with Soviet communism disappeared sometime in the late 60s, that capitalism and I usually put that in quotes because it's rarely defined, is the most efficient way to manage economic resources. Now, there's two ways to use the, the term. Karl Marx used the word capitalism to refer to the domination of capital, or oligarchy. It was not a, not a good thing. Capital ruling society, of course, socialism and society ruling society. But there's also the somewhat an accurate definition that this is the free market, the myth that Adam Smith put out of perfect competition. And it's a myth because it's meant to be one. It's meant to be similar to um, the states of nature of Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. The myth of perfect competition is a hypothetical situation where you have consumers and producers without any clear product, with full knowledge of each other. Actually, the, the product is identical. Um, the consumer has a full knowledge of the product and vice versa. And that's meant to be this primeval state of human affairs. It's not quite a state of nature, but it's in the same vein. Smith was a utilitarian. He didn't believe in, in rights in the same way that that Locke did. Um, his argument really comes down to local efficiency. But in 1776, his famous book, a uh, very long work, he's mostly a moral uh, theoretician, but it's one of these books that's quoted all the time, that's cited all the time, but few people ever bother to read it. And it doesn't use technical language. Smith says a lot in there that most people don't know. Um, now, the concept is, if you were to ask one of these mainstream conservatives today, they'll tell you that due to competition, competition among enterprises, they have to use their inputs very sparingly to hold prices down. Of course, input would also include labor. Now, that refers to markets, not the domination of capital. 
Now, of course, one of the definitions of oligarchy that I've used in the past is a small ruling class that can charge rents. Rents are not prices. Rents are what you can charge when you're in a position of great political power over and above what the theoretic free market would charge for. So, you know, if you're in a government position, you could get something very cheaply. If you know somebody in the field, you can get input at cost, etc. Um, rents are what you do when you don't respond to the market. You create it. But this isn't true as far as, um, um, as, far as the free market uh, mythology is concerned. As it's functioned in, let's say, the second half of the 20th century, capitalism is an extremely wasteful and vulgar system. Thorstein Veblen, Veblen, who I've mentioned a few times before, developed an entire theory on capitalism and waste. The capitalist mentality posits an impossibility that a human being is a calculating machine. And simple um, financial uh, money in, money out mentality is all they think about. They want to buy cheap, they sell dear, but that's not quite accurate. Because human beings are not calculating machines, they are usually psychological messes, um, that's not how consumers operate. After World War II, the rule of credit, even down to the lowliest worker, was extended maybe by the mid-60s. Of course, the credit card shortly thereafter, which gave the impression that they had more money than they did. The post-war boom is based entirely on credit, not just for um, elites, but for, uh, over time, everyone. Which makes sense from the capitalist point of view, but it is contradictory. Most consumer spending is wasteful, and Veblen's theory um, which goes back to the turn of the century, um, is because it's emulating others who have money. Now, he wrote The Theory of the Leisure Class in 1899. He's not talking about mass society here, but it's certainly applicable. You know, the titans of industry, and I use the word titan in its original um, meaning in Greek mythology, uh, they're identical to any of the barbarian conquerors in the past. They use economics rather than rather than armies, but the behavior is identical. Talking about modern capitalism, Charles Darwin, not Adam Smith, is the main theorist, as people like Herbert Spencer have made clear. Um, the methods of consumer spending might be rational, but the ends and the purposes of it are not. This is the difference between logic and reason. So, the theory of the work, the theory of the leisure class, is taking economics out of its mathematical isolation and putting it in a broader, um, more comprehensive understanding of of society. This is what the Romantics did in the nineteenth century. This is what nationalist economics is is based on. Economics isn't just mathematical formula. People aren't just calculating machines. But his principal thesis is that once civilization developed to the extent where you had a minority that could remove itself from direct production, this is the origin of the ruling class. The leisure class of those who live a parasitical life, they rule and they take without actually producing anything. But that's what oligarchs do. And that's an extreme case today, because really it's it's finance, not production, that drive uh, what they what they call economic growth. So in Veblen's theory, he refers to a very specific time in feudal Europe. Um, there, of course, you had class divisions. We really talking about the Frankish Empire here. Class divisions were very strict, and a group of families could be free from direct labor. And these, for the most part, became a warrior aristocracy, or at least originated from the warrior class. Now, to be very simple about it, the leisure class 
within the same position, but they don't even do that. Since they didn't produce, they had to live from those who did. Now, it's not just that one class was freed from manual work or actually production of any kind. But now today, they, or even when he was writing, this class redefined the concept of work entirely. Um, and by the way, speaking of feudal Europe, I should note that my book on medieval political thought is now available. Um, today is the 17th. It should be up on Amazon. Um, I will um, have a link in the description or somewhere on the site for you to take a look at it. Um, some of these essays go back a little ways, but they've been completely rewritten. It deals with um, both Byzantium and the Frankish Empire. It deals with the Atonian Empire. It deals with medieval art and architecture. The entire um, metaphysics of the medieval mind. Uh, and I'll have a link for this. I, I want to keep prices down. I'm going to sell it maybe for $16. And there's a Kindle edition as well. Anyway. And I, by the way, I do think that the concept of the feudal aristocracy is a bit simplified. But this is social theory, so we're talking about abstractions. Anyway, from there, ruling class is able, primarily through their own social influence, to give their own work and what they did the title of honorable. And manual labor became something base and vulgar, something that um, uh, was considered the domain of the ignorant. The concept of the gentleman is an aristocratic a man who doesn't have to work with his hands. The notion of um, the alabaster skin of a female means she doesn't have to be in the fields. Even the Chinese uh, foot binding tradition, obviously you can't work. That's not the only reason they did it, but um, these are all signs of aristocratic idleness. But in Veblen's idea, the, the ruling strata in the Western world developed at the same time private property did. Now, this is where it gets vague, because now he's going way back before you had real substantial records. But he makes the argument that tribal societies, I, I'm assuming he means hunters and gatherers, that these were not stratified, which has been challenged recently. But once settled agriculture took over, a ruling class emerged. Ultimately, what comes, comes about is that this class has a near monopoly on the wealth it did not create. And, of course, craft a culture that justified um, this lifestyle. So consuming without working was indicative of a superior mind. Now, today it's far more vulgar than that. Because if you have money and you flaunt it, which is the only reason you, you want money, um, the, the miser idea is a very old, earlier capitalist concept. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it doesn't matter where the origin of the money is. You're someone respected and taken very seriously and really considered intelligent. Somehow money automatically confers class and, and education. So it's the ignorant who have to work while the superior take the work of others. Um, despite the fact that the Middle Ages really is the origin of the dignity of labor, which, of course, the church always preached, the socialism of the church fathers I've talked about in at great length, and Veblen's own work, it's hard to tell what era in history he's referring to because he uses abstractions. But this is how early modernity developed. And certainly once you get into the rule of financial capital, people working on Wall Street or in finance, who literally produce nothing, and who live on usury, which is a crime in and of itself. Usury, in fact, is a rent. It's one of the, one of the prime examples of rents, being able to create money and charge interest on it simply because you have the power to create it. Um, you have a completely parasitic existence. But that kind of labor today in the mass mind is still considered extremely prestigious, despite the fact they don't actually do anything. That money, you know, stocks and bonds, has to come from somewhere, and it certainly doesn't come from them. Wealth has to come from production. Um, so as modernity develops, this is one of the cardinal points of, of the modern world, the possession of property becomes the basis of respect and even self-esteem. 
wealth itself, just by its very existence, it becomes a sign of superiority. And in the form of acquisition doesn't mean anything. Once acquired, property then gets noticed and respect is granted. And it's very difficult to even challenge that. You're accused of being jealous or whatever. But the rest, the people they live off of, these are just the anonymous mass. So Veblen's idea is to argue that having more property than others is not just an economic fact, but it's both a, a mental and a cultural one as well. So those considered wealthy, and there's a distinction between wealth and income, but I think in the mass mind there is really no distinction like that. Those possessing uh, wealth are seen as being more cultured, wise, or even just more devious than others, which of course is probably the case. Um, but somehow money conferring intelligence and class um, and um, legitimate power, that somehow they must have worked very hard for this, is still a, a, um, a social prejudice. His argument, of course, is that whether it be a modern capitalist or feudal or slaveholding societies, somehow the Darwinian idea of the rich are seen as those who have emerged victorious over rivals, and therefore, because of that, are a um, legitimate ruling class. Now, the problem is that this class, no matter what era he's talking about, really does consider it, uh, considers itself virtue, uh, virtuous um, and superior, primarily because of wealth, even if it's inherited. So he argues that what begins as military conquest, as the generations go on, ends in idleness for the wealthy who aren't really required to add value to anything. They simply consume. Ultimately, the American dream is to be able to have a large income without working. Not realizing, of course, that work is one of the things that makes us human. The labor can be alienated labor, but simply to be idle and just have unlimited income, despite it being the prejudice of the mass mind, is of course not even a human existence. Now, some of that is passé today. But in the mass mind, it does associate property with superiority, seeks exactly this kind of wealth for itself. The hatred of the wealthy has nothing to do with wealth itself, it's just that they don't have it. And if they can get it, they will behave exactly like the people who they claim to hate. In the ancient world, coins acted as talismans, quite literally taking on magic qualities that, once gained, bestows all kinds of wisdom and power and and legitimate authority on him. Of course, that's just a myth. But money is so powerful that it can create its own world. So, in order to illustrate, in order to, um, to confirm one's power, especially in the eyes of your own class, high levels of consumption are necessary. So, um, for example, uh, automobiles are one of the symbols of, of America. They're culturally significant. You have many brands, you have many makes, all of which will accomplish basic transportation. But we all know dollars and cents aren't really the issue here. Basic transportation is not the issue here. Um, the Lexus, for example, is assumed to be higher quality than a Camry, despite the two cars being extremely similar. It's of higher quality because it's more expensive. The Lexus symbolizes upper-class life, and of course the advertising tries to reinforce that. A lot of British accents and things like that. But it's also wasteful, since the Toyota Camry is much less costly. And um, but the production of a Lexus is simply wasted effort, since it exists only to satisfy the status demands of a certain class. And those not in that class... Um, want to get their hands on one, even if they can't afford it. The entire thing is to put forth a certain image to others. So this goes way beyond utilitarianism, which still economics is, is based on. Products are not valued for their benefits, but how one product distinguishes the person from others. So it's an invitation, so to speak, to um, envy and envious comparisons, which drives 
much production. I'm willing to say that for men, their consumption is driven almost entirely to get the attention of women. If men were asexual, they would be leading a very austere life. They're minimalists. So much male wealth, uh, their interest in fashion and jewelry and everything else has more to do with attracting women than anything else, but it also has a lot to do with communicating to the world that there is success. We even have the phrase, uh, you're worth, he's worth a million dollars, he's worth a billion dollars, as if to say that you're worth entirely quantitative. So conspicuous leisure is similar in that it's a non-productive consumption of time. Um, but of course, that's the oligarchy. An aristocracy can say that studying Plato or playing the piano are um, not necessarily life skills, but to do this isn't, um, isn't wasteful at all, economically speaking, but it's a requirement of fulfilling class obligation. That's not what we're talking about here. This is a distinction between an aristocracy and an oligarchy. Now, the point of all of this, and, and because psychology and economics are isolated from one another, economics as an academic discipline now is almost entirely mathematic and therefore misses the point. All of this strongly implies that the market economy is defined not so much by efficiency or any responsiveness to actual needs, but ostentatious extravagance and envious comparison, which is another way of saying waste and inefficiency. Competition isn't really just an economic mechanism, but something hardwired into the human brain, as he would say, especially from centuries of social struggle and justifies dominion. Darwin is the apostle of modern capitalism, not Smith or even Locke. Um, but in, in the modern world, uh, writers like Holt in 1998, this kind of takes the form of, of processes of, of consumption. Um, the upper class, the ruling class, well, you name not just the ruling class, but the higher classes, today view themselves as critical, cosmopolitan, and secular. This is one of the things, you know, the, the, the liberal culture that they're going to bring to the world. Those of the lower classes are consequently conformist, regional, and religious. Now, whether this is true isn't the point. Or even if these labels describe anything of value, that's not essential. That's what the cultural type is. The upper class consumer sees himself as an individual, while seeing, of course, the lower class competitor as part of a herd. The concept of the, the word masses, while it can be descriptive and accurate, still eliminates any well or any any value to anyone outside of those those classes. 1999, Goss wrote a book um, analyzing the Mall of America. And it's a f more intensely critical understanding of this kind of waste and extravagance. And he argues that the leisure class in America is completely fraudulent. All of their social ideas, norms, and images are false. And of course, I've been arguing this for a very long time. And he proved this by saying that an authentic life is projected onto products. Commodities, not people, create the sense of, of fullness and satisfaction. They never quite reach satisfaction. But using the examples I've already mentioned, um, a poor man who wins a Lexus in a raffle may see himself as successful just based on that fact alone because he's driving this car. He is accomplished or, or of the upper class because of the fact that the commodity has this image that the upper classes have culturally stamped on it. Now, Karl Marx is often, very much like Adam Smith, um, cited, quoted all the time, mentioned. Very few of his works are really ever read, even by educated people. The assumption, especially after the Frankfurt School got a hold of him, He's misinterpreted as an, as an enemy of conspicuous consumption, and this isn't true. Now, he does say, I'm quoting from the earlier manuscripts in the 1840s, Marx says, Under the system of private property, each person speculates on creating a new need in the other, 
with the aim of forcing him to make a new sacrifice, placing him in a new dependence and seducing him into a new kind of enjoyment, and hence to economic ruin. The expansion of production and needs becomes the inventive and ever-calculating slave of inhuman, refined, unnatural, and imaginary appetites. For private property doesn't know how to transform crude need into human need. No eunuch flatters his despot more basely or uses more infamous means of, to revive his flagging capacity for pleasure in order to win his rupturous favor for himself than does a eunuch of industry, the manufacturer. Now, that's something that, that I would say, of course. Um, in his early works, he's saying that translating desires into needs over time could be a recipe for domination. That is, in fact, another example of charging rents and is a form of usury. But that is not what he meant at the time. A quote like that, which gets trotted out all the time, he was condemning the idle consumption of the elite wealthy at the time. He didn't live long enough to see today's credit-fueled consumer, consumer life. This is a very recent phenomenon. The middle class is a creation of credit, first which came from you know, department stores like Bambergers and Macy's, and then the banks took over giving these mini loans through the development of the credit card in the 70s, uh, or even before then. That's a very recent phenomenon. Now, without fully understanding how that would develop, um, by 1861, in Marx's uh, Fundamentals of a Critique of Political Economy, he then sees con what we would call consumerism of actually is actually a part of human liberation. He actually refers to this. So then he says, the greater the extent to which historic needs are posited as necessary, the higher the level to which real wealth has become developed. The transformation of what was previously superfluous into what is now necessary as a historically created necessity is a tendency of capital. Luxury is the opposite of the naturally necessary. Necessary needs are those of the individual himself reduced to only a natural subject. In other words, Civilization advances, not just in technical development, but also in the very act of translating what was formerly just a want into a, into a need. When he refers to a natural subject, he's referring to man as man, something primitive, something primeval, just basic necessities. And that's exactly what needs to be overcome, because in you know classic Marxism, that's exactly the only thing that, that capital really wants to make sure of, is that the worker doesn't die. Marx says in the same, uh, same work, artificial need is what the economist calls, firstly, the needs which arise out of the social existence of the individual, secondly, those which do not flow from his naked existence as a natural object. This shows the inner desperate poverty which forms the basis of bourgeois wealth and its science. Once come from social life. But needs, on the other hand, are biological facts. But biological facts aren't really interesting. There's nothing you can really do with them. Now, the concept, of course, is that the proliferation of needs is the march of human freedom. Transferring uh, what was a luxury yesterday into a necessity today is a very positive thing. It's easy to forget in early modernity, the so-called Puritan um, origins of, of modern capitalism, or that mentality, generally speaking, almost a, an ascetic restriction, which Adam Smith refers to, um, is not a Marxist idea. That's a very early capitalist idea. Um, in fact, Marx even condemns capitalism in his day for restricting consumerism, which again shows that popularism is yet again completely false. To the extent that wants are transformed into necessities, civilization advances. So now Marx did talk about false needs. He's talking about you know the, the bourgeois oligarch mentality. Um, but the theory of false needs is capitalist ideology, but only in the 19th century. As the Puritan idea began to leave capitalism, as credit became uh, available to everyone, as the capacity for production just went, you know, to a superhuman level, that production had to be absorbed, and therefore consumers had to be able to consume. Now, 
Accumulation is not the same thing as consumption. Accumulation, in, in Marx's term, and in most economics, is, is reinvesting the profits into the general capital stock, building the, the productive capacity. Rather, as in today, it's dispersal into, into commodities. So early capitalism was based on accumulation, the building of the capital stock, reinvesting, and from there, the idea of the, the almost ascetic um, uh, Puritan miser developed. But that's not the case today, for very clear reasons. Um, so, and you still have some Marxists today who believe that that's the case, clearly not ever visiting a Walmart before. Um, but Marx actually condemns capitalism for exactly this miserly attitude, a marginally attitude which obviously no longer exists. It couldn't exist anymore. Um, and the exponent of the mercantile system um, in the second volume of Capital, Marx says that a capitalist nation should leave the consumption of its commodities and consumption in general to other more stupid nations while making productive consumption into its own life's work. These sermons are often reminiscent in both form and content of analogous ascetic or exhort exhortations by the fathers of the church. I'm pretty sure that's the only time Karl Marx ever actually mentioned the, father of the fathers of the church in anything he ever wrote. In a very broad sense, of course, they were all socialists, although not in the modern conception. St. Ambrose of Milan, who I've dealt with before, was extremely opposed to the very concept of private property. And remember, private property and... Um, Personal property are two very different things. Um, but Adam Smith um, is one of the people who Marx took aim at. Um, Adam Smith distinguished between what he would call the principle of expense and the principle of frugality. And he says that every prodigal is a public enemy and every frugal man a public benefactor. In 1776, the foundation of capitalist ideology is that consumerism dissipates capital. It's almost as if Smith preached frugality at home, but consumption was for export. Um, uh, Ishe Landa in the work Historical Materialism writes that Smith therefore unfavorably compared Paris whose vast trade is undertaken mainly to indulge its own consumption, with London, Lisbon, and Copenhagen, whose advantageous situation suits them to be the entrepot of, great, of a great part of goods destined for the consumption of distant places. This is a very mysterious comment, meaning that consumption is for others. For everyone else, uh, especially the European elite, the work and accumulation um, was our business. In other words, consumption was vulgar. Consumption was for others who were simply more ignorant. Accumulation is for the capitalist to leave. This is an aspect of, of Smith that almost never gets discussed. But Adam Smith fights, as he calls, the passion for present enjoyment, despite its necessity. I mean, exports can't possibly, you know, export markets back then were, couldn't have been very large. Marx condemned the what he called the cult of money, which at the time was based on self-sacrifice, not the passions that uh, the modern consumer indulges in. Again, he says that the accumulation of wealth, that's the goal of capitalist production, its prime motivation. And Smith condemns the idea of any kind of conspic conspicuous enjoyment. Um, and he even says uh, that, uh, even, even Marx himself says, the, any kind of conspicuous uh, consumption in the capitalist mind of his day is done with a guilty conscience, with frugality and thrift at the back of his mind. So then Marx says, the ultimate reason for all real crises always remains the poverty and restricted consumption of the masses in the face of the drive of capitalist production to develop the productive forces as if only the absolute consumption capacity of society set a limit to them. Now remember, the difference between products and commodities a commodity is always unnecessary, at least at the time. A commodity is a luxury good. 
something people buy for the reasons we're already talking about. A product is not. A product is something necessary. Um, now, Land and a few others say that capitalism has a problem, you know, and I can't even believe how we could say this, but consumerism has a problem with consumption only because it raises expectations to the point where it can no longer meet them. And he completely underestimates the power of the media and the power of capital to create substitutes and cheap imitations of luxury items. But people like him uh, forget, although Karl Marx never did, is that capitalism is inherently revolutionary. It wants to break boundaries. It wants to alter consciousness. There is no such thing as a socialist revolution in Marx without the destructive and corrosive um, work of capitalism. But part of the socialist revolution in Marx's point of view is to unleash consumerism, which, you know, um, turned out to be pretty uh, ironic in the, in the Soviet experiment. Now, back to Veblen and, and others talking about the, the waste of, of modern capitalism. Um, in the early years, even up to, you know, Veblen's writing at the turn of the century, um, not only did the wealthy have the opportunity to order the new world of consumer goods, but slowly began to extend the possibility of the lower classes emulating them. Um, again, you know, 18th century France, uh, Cabas in 2003 wrote about this. Um, you know, back then, ostentation consumption was criticized. It was criticized as wasteful. But given the power of the new rich, it didn't last. Soon it was money that decided this. Consumption, far from being extravagant, was a, a spur to production. But that took some time to develop. In a period of accumulation, that can't be the case. Only when that accumulation reaches a certain point where it can safely be um, dispersed in the consumer mentality. But that consumer mentality is the rule of the spectacle. Um, the Mall of America example comes up quite often. Um, there's no doubt that the Western world, especially the American world, has been in a state of depression at least since 2008. But the resources wasted on non-essential things at a time of profound crisis. So it's exactly how wasteful and inefficient the system is. Um, and I began thinking of all these examples when you consider these huge projects for no clear reason. Uh, reading about the, the Belgian music festival called The Boom. It's a creation of an entire town. In 2015, the entire town where this festival took place took a whole year to build. It was an entire, you know, just, you know, things like uh, movie budgets. Um, these huge, you know, at a time of economic crisis, they are build, building entire towns for one music festival. This is not an efficient use of, of resources. They actually built a, a castle in a real town, as if that's absolutely necessary for a, a music festival. Um, sports arenas are, are an obvious target. Um, the Barclays Center, where the Islanders play and, and the Nets, in 2010, it was built from 2010 to 2012, the complex cost a billion dollars. It has an Oculus roof, has this massive interior screen, one of the most impressive stadiums out there, but an also an impressive waste. There is no market requirement for any of this. This ridiculous diversion of resources is a symbol of dominance. It's almost a symbol of usury in and of itself. The system can prove that it could waste resources like this in the midst of massive insecurity and unemployment. Um, U.S. Bank Stadium in Minneapolis opened in uh, 2016. Again, $1.1 billion. It's the Viking Stadium. Uh, 66,000 capacity. Um, I think the Super Bowl was there in 2018. Its architecture is incredible. 60% of the stadium's roof is transparent, which is the largest such roof in existence. There are five 95-foot-high pivoting glass doors that open to a three-acre plaza and an amazing view of the skyline. Now, 
I, I can't imagine that even the, the hardest core Viking fan can avoid admitting that this is a massive waste of labor. Minneapolis is drowning in debt. Even before last year, it was considered one of the most dangerous cities uh, in America. In 2013, Moody's downgraded the city's credit rating. Was there this mass demand for this uh, architectural wonder? These amenities, this stadium? Was there this, a huge petition for a transparent roof? We all know the state of um, Detroit, the only major city in America to go into full receivership. Just a few years ago, Ford Stadium was built. They built a new football stadium for of all teams, Alliance, and a new hockey stadium. In the midst of the literal dissolution of the entire city, dire poverty, crime, out of control, a police department um, melting away, they build a billion-dollar stadium complex. Still, I don't recall a mass rally where people were demanding this. This is the oligarchy erecting a symbol for its own dominance. I believe that there's more security for the football stadium than there is in the Detroit Police Department. And they certainly make more money. This is a massive waste of resources. It is a symbol of oligarchic dominance. Movies alone. Avatar costs $420 million to make. Um, even the Harry Potter series always costs at least $200 million. So if the nation can't pay its bills, the overwhelming majority of citizens literally owning nothing, which means the average American own, owes far more than he owns, which means he owes nothing. Um, you know, a mortgage is not an ownership of a house. It's a rent paid to a bank. The average NFL team makes over $250 million per season, and they produce absolutely nothing of value. Again, this is not an efficient use of resources. Now, in the building of these structures, you may have a certain degree of efficiency with bidding and everything else, although I'm sure I could challenge that too. It's not so much the actual act of erecting these things. It's the reason why they're put up in the first place. Um, just not too long ago, um, the uh, at, at Disneyland, of all places, the cost of adding just a Radiator Springs Racers attraction to Cars Land at Disney, the California Adventure, was almost $750 million for a single amusement park ride. Um, you know, examples can go on and on. Eddie Murphy bought uh, Rooster K, an island in the Bahamas, for $15 million. Mel Gibson bought Mago in Fiji for $9 million. We could go on and on about these people um, with massive amounts of money for no obvious reason. Um, Larry Ellis, the billionaire, owns 98% of Lanai, the sixth largest island in Hawaii. None of these things, none of these wastes of resources are useful in any possible way. They're wasteful, ostentatious forms of self-congratulation that prove people like Veblen correct. It is an irrational system because it comes from a disordered mind. I read not too long ago, Mariah Carey spends $100,000 a month ordering exotic flowers from around the world to accompany her wherever she happens to be. This is a moral question as much as it's an economic one. It's a blatant use, waste of resources, which, by the way, a waste of resources perfectly consistent with the market system. And even if you were to simply say that, well, this is where people want to put their money, that just begs the question. That doesn't make any sense as it stands. Markets aren't followed. Oligarchy doesn't respond to markets. One of the definitions of oligarchy is that it creates markets. This is not something that people would normally do under normal circumstances. These are anything but normal circumstances. But I have to say that probably my favorite example, and it's kind of a minor one, is um, the Glace Luxury Ice Company in California. They produce perfectly square ice cubes for what they call minimum dilution and maximum cooling. 
They're hand-carved, completely clear. These cubes are sold in bags of 50, and they each one costs about $325. It's almost as if the oligarchs are mocking us. None of these can even remotely be considered a rational use of resources, despite the fact that the production of these things itself may be very efficient. Mass production and, and um, you know, buying, you know, labor and, and inputs at the lowest possible price, etc. That's really not the point. And defenders of capitalism will distract us with that. The point is how damaged the soul must be where this product exists at all. And the football stadiums are um, some of my favorite examples because, again, there's really no public demand for these. No one was, was screaming and yelling at the old stadiums. They know that these people can be manipulated into buying anything. Uh, although, I don't think anymore. Uh, I wrote, wrote this before. The NFL went crazy ideologically and is losing um, support all over the place. It doesn't keep them from doing this, though. The fact that they're dropping, uh, NFL supporters are dropping like flies, doesn't um, prevent these kind of projects from still being planned, proving it has nothing to do with that. It is a form of self-congratulation. It has nothing to do, it's very opposite of efficiency. It is completely irrational, especially at a time um, the last few decades of extreme economic crisis and unemployment. So, these are just a few examples. And they represent irrationality, destructive spending. It's a what we would call a market failure. No system can produce millionaires who create nothing and then spend this money on non-productive and wasteful objects and be called rational. This is a massive amount of capital and labor taken out of a system that desperately needs it. Capital, by the way, produced by those who never even see it. In the book Estimating the Economic Surplus, it was from Phillips in 1966, he wrote, in general, the largest part of waste, he's referring to the business process here, is associated with the process of selling the output of business. This includes much of the much expen um, such expenditures as advertising, market research, expense account entertaining, the maintenance of excessive numbers of sales outlets, the salaries and bonuses of salesmen, closely related or outlays for such activities, public relations, lobbying, rental and maintenance of showy office buildings, business litigation, etc. We could go on, you know, salaries and CEO salaries and and the the asset stripping that I've spoken so much about on this on this show. Billions of dollars a week are spent on advertising and lobby. Massive campaigns are erected and celebrities paid off. Tons of food wasted every day is evidence of absurdity. Roughly 50% of all produce in America is thrown in the garbage. Wasted food is the largest component of all landfills. Supermarkets throw away an orange or an apple has the slightest blemish because food has to look good and has to appear sexy and appealing even if they have to use artificial methods to do it. Even a slight deviation in appearance leads to the produce being thrown in the trash. You can continue with examples until I'm blue in the face. This isn't a rational system. Although the production of these things may be itself rational, that's not the point. It may be logical, it may be efficient, but the fact that they're done at all is where the damage can be found. Capitalism wastes resources. It's almost based on it. New product lines are introduced with very minor changes. Planned obsolescence. As of a few years ago, less than 20% of all investment in the U.S. is productive, actually in the process of making something. The rest is some form of financial or service product. Capitalism wastes money. Currency trades alone absorb a huge percentage of what we would call economic growth. Less than 20% of investment is directed to actual production of anything useful. 80% is invested directly in financial products. 
it always struck people why a company like Anheuser-Busch needs to advertise at all. None of us forget that they exist. We know what beer is. Advertising budgets generally almost entirely wasteful. As of a few years ago, Pampers had the highest budget at $10 billion a year. Gillette had $8 billion. Chevy had $5 billion. Ford, $4.3. Coke had $4 billion. Which is strange, because all of these products are very well known. We know what a Chevy does, what a Razor does. They don't require advertising, and yet they spend a massive amount of money on it. Now, these may be considered somewhat frivolous, but even the UK Guardian reported that the privatization of the rail railways led to exactly this, destructive and wasteful practices. State-run mainline rail services, according to Wren in 2011, require fewer subsidies and use inputs more sparingly than the remaining 15 privatized rail companies. In the very same article in The Guardian, Wren says that the state-run UK health service is cheaper than the privatized services in the U.S. Healthcare spending per person is far higher in the U.S. than in the U.K., with inferior results. Japan spends less than half per person than the USA, yet enjoys an average life expectancy close to 80. Cuba has a superior life expectancy and a lower rate of infant mortality than the U.S. at a much lower cost per person. Now, this could be exaggerated, but there's not necessarily a lot of evidence that private ownership of capital is inherently more rational than state ownership or any other kind of corporate ownership. Robert Millward says in 2011, again concerning Britain, on the new evidence, the British total factor productivity growth record in most of the nationalized industries was significantly better than that of their U.S. counterparts and better than in the whole of the British economy. To be more specific, the average annual rate of total factor productivity growth from 1950 to 1973 was higher in Britain than in the U.S. for airlines, electricity, gas, and coal. The proposition that privatization in Britain led to an improvement is contradicted by comparison of these figures with those from 1973 to 1995 when growth rates for airlines, gas, electricity were much lower. The state enterprise in Britain compared favorably in productivity growth with comparable res- sectors in the more privately owned U.S. industries and with the privatized regimes which followed in Britain. Now, his book came out in 2011 in the essay, comes from a book, of course, the purpose of which is challenging the doctrine that the private sector investments are inherently more efficient than the state sector. They're not, at least in certain areas. And he reminds us that after World War II, most British industry was in state hands. It didn't keep it, it didn't keep the country from having a massive post-war boom. While privatization occurred at a time of mass unemployment, inequality, and extraordinary ex- exploitation. Many examples can be, can be cited. And remember, there's other forms of ownership rather than simply individual uh, or you know, the corporate uh, conglomerate model and state. I've been over this in, you know, in, in not only the Middle Ages, but in old Russia, um, employee-owned industries, etc., the use of guilds and, and, uh, and unions. There's many forms of ownership that rarely get even discussed. But the British example is worth worth. Uh, getting deeper into. Capitalism isn't, it is neither efficient nor rational. They fail on all counts. The gains of capitalism go to the unproductive. Bankers and middlemen, not producers, not inventors, and not even entrepreneurs. Capital mobility today means that a firm can hold an entire community hostage. It could demand low wages and regulations to their walk. And in doing so, they could destroy an entire area, which, by the way, shows their moral compass. While talking about the market system, they'll still demand tax breaks and subsidies, or they'll relocate elsewhere. They'll relocate to some place that will indulge them. They invest in slave slave, slave labor, labor regions, then sell the product back home at prices just below that of domestic producers which pocket an immense, wasteful, and irrational profit. This has nothing to do with efficiency. It's just capital mobility. 
the concept of a labor-saving device. All that means is that a company can get rid of more people. Introducing labor-saving devices just means that the workers that remain after the purge have a lot more to do. So you think of a company that buys a machine that could do the work of 10 employees twice as fast. This means that the firm now can fire half and keep the rest at the same price. Production will rise and the profits go to the owner, not only in labor savings, but in the increased efficiency of the new mechanism. So this labor-saving device has just gutted a company without lowering the level of workload for employees. That's how these things actually operate in practice. That means labor-saving devices do nothing but permit owners to demand more and more production from fewer and fewer workers. But John Maynard Keynes uh, predicted almost 100 years ago that technical developments will lead to a 15-hour work week, apparently having no concept of how business owners operate. But that sort of production, I'm sorry, that sort of prediction can exist only in the isolated environment where individuals are seen as rational. Thinking that technological development will mean that workers in industry don't have to work very much is ridiculous. What it means is that we'll get rid of as many people as humanly possible and force the rest to work more. That's a massive profit for them. In 1966, the minimum wage was introduced in America. And it's roughly, I think it was a dollar sixty-five. If the minimum wage kept pace with worker productivity, it depends on who you read, the estimates would be between $60 and $100 an hour today. Well, it's not that. That means there's a massive surplus that's got to go somewhere, and it doesn't go to the people who actually make anything. So when you have these um, naive ideas of human rationality, in economics, this is the kind of nonsense you get where Keynes uh, predicting a 15-hour work week. Now, of course, using the example of the labor-saving device here, the really rational thing to do is to keep all 10 workers with a lesser workload. That would be a win-win for everybody. Employees are much happier, society benefits, and the owner sees no change in prices or costs. The problem is, like in Thomas Hobbes' world, the competition won't do this, so the owner is forced to cut labor to the bone. So Graeber wrote in 2016, Rather than allowing a massive reduction of working hours to free the world's population to pursue their own projects, pleasures, visions, and ideas, we have seen the ballooning not even so much of the service sector as of the administrative sector, up until including the creation of whole new industries like financial services or telemarketing, with the unprecedented expansion of sectors like corporate law, academic and health administration, human resources, and public relations. And these numbers don't even reflect on all the people whose job it is to provide administrative, technical, or security support for those industries. Or for that matter, the whole host of ancillary industries, like dog washers, all-night pizza delivery men, that only exist because everyone else is spending so much of their time working on all the other ones. Then one would think that, in our example here, the five workers that would remain since the machine cuts labor time in half, in modern America, without strong unions and at-will employment, the truth really is only four workers would remain, since salaries, rather than hourly wages, permit workers to be worked at 80 more hours a week without violating labor laws. The whole concept of a salary was to exploit workers without gaining the ire of the Labor Department. The few decent jobs left in the U.S. mean that there are few alternatives. Owners can do as they please. Since 1975, wages for male workers in America has dropped 35%. But at the exact same time, productivity per worker has skyrocketed. So where does this surplus go? The point is, is that capitalist efficiency and logic is a myth. The point of capitalism, socially speaking, is to render labor totally isolated from one from another, and with no social ties to avoid any kind of organization. And I wrote this before 2020. The point is to work employees, the few that remain, pass endurance, and to squeeze more productivity per worker. It is an oligarchy where they charge rents, it's short-term control over markets and resources, 
really is considered the sine qua non of success. Markets are created, not responded to. Capitalism is absurdly inefficient. To only look at the process of production itself is to see really with only one eye shut. As always, social science is not permitted to ask why these processes exist, since it's a moral question. You could murder somebody in a very efficient and cost-effective way. That doesn't mean murder is a good thing. It's nothing to celebrate. The uses of technique, what techniques are put towards, are far more important than the technique itself. But given the nature of the social sciences, it's the one area that they cannot talk about. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.